All right, so today we'll be learning about a new type of sort, which is, you know, this tutorial is more of an extension of lecture. So uh, today we'll be learning about, about bubble sort and the bubble sort is very simple. So give, say we are given a list of something and we need to sort them. The way we need to sort them is basically, uh, we'll be going through the numbers one by one. And we take a pair and then basically we swap them if there's anything that's not in the right position. For that, I'm just going to show you guys a visualization to make it easy. So say we have an array of numbers, 3, 44, 38, 5, 47, 15, 36, and so on. We'll try to sort them. Now, I'll show you the visuals and then try to understand of what is going on here, what is happening here and from what's going on here then we'll try to come up with the python code for it so if you see now it goes like the way it moves right it just takes two numbers at a time it takes in two numbers at a time and then like if there's anything that is not in the right position it will swap them up You keep on doing that until everything is sorted. Okay, so if you see right, um, basically it will just swap, start swapping things around. And then like as it swaps, like the biggest number will always be at the end. So like I think you can see right, uh, as we sort right, the parts at the end will always get big and big. Uh, will, the, the big numbers will be collected at the end. Lah. So let's not try doing that. Okay. Oh, yeah, a bit sleepy. So according to the assignment paper, if you actually open your assignment PDF, um, tutorial PDF, there's two functions that we need to define. First is def bubble and def bubble sort. So what happened in def bubble is Def bubble sort is basically it is just like uh you just do bubble repetitively. You just keep on repeating it multiple times. So we just we need to define bubble first. If you can see what a bubble means is that you go through the list one time and then basically swap the positions one by one if there's any changes. So We'll do a loop and then based on the slide deck we want to compare list i minus one and list i so let's compare that if list i is smaller than the previous item then basically we want to swap it it goes to this i i want this one return list 
Now let's try. Now uh, I have already ma made a list before. So okay, let's go back. Let's create a list. Let's use the same list as this one. Let's fix this a bit. Oh boy, that's a lot of numbers. Imagine if we need to sort them one by one. Quite a nightmare. Okay, so let's try. All right, it's it's. I think it has gone through one pass, so it's okay. As we can see, yeah, I think it has gone through one pass. Okay, generally what we want to do is that uh, we want to put one here because uh, the reason being is because if you put zero right uh, it will here it will compare like uh, lst zero we compare with lst minus one uh, in this case minus one will right will compare with the item on the end which is not right lah. we don't compare with the item at the end because it's not completely linked we just want to compare the first two, first two, first two. So we want to kind of limit it to, from one. So we'll just start with here and compare with the things on the back. So now, now let's do it bubble sort. The question is like, how many passes do we need to actually uh, sort the entire list? Okay. So, I mean, um, generally speaking, uh, you, you know that every sort, right? At every sort, um, we'll run the algorithm again, and we know that at every sort, we know that uh, one number is always sorted, which is the number at the end. At every bubble, now this bubble will keep on adding, adding, and adding, and adding. So we know that at least, right, the least um, the the maximum number right, is actually uh, the um, the number of items in the list. And then I simply return the list. And yeah, finally the list is sorted. Okay. All right, are there any questions regarding bubble sort? If there are no questions, I have a question for you, which is already in the tutorial worksheet. Now, the final question is like, do we really need to actually apply so many times like, do we actually, like, remember our algorithm earlier, right? Like, here, we know that at every iteration, the numbers at the back will be sorted. Hence, we can actually, like, we know for certain that if we keep on repeating it n times, then, like, the n last numbers will be sorted, which is the entire list. Lah. But the question is, do we really need to apply so many times? And do we really need to bubble sort for the entire list? Now, think about this question. I'm going to show you again the sorting algorithm and try to also wait, 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 wait. Holy, why is it keep on moving? Okay. I think I'll just put it in. Okay. 
try to see the algorithm and try to see what are the improvements that we can make. Do we really need to run it n times? And do we really need to do an intact complete bubble sort? Okay, so you've you guys have seen it. So anyone like uh, type in, in your chat your thoughts. What do you guys think about it? Do you guys really need to sort everything out? Or do you guys just like think like um uh no need, right? So how can we improve our algorithm? Can you suggest like any improvements that can be done? What are the things that we can improve? Oh, you see, if after the bubble, then the list is still the same as the previous list, then you can stop already. Pardon? Sorry, sorry. Can you repeat? Is it like after the bubble, right? Uh, if the list is still the same as the previous list, then can stop the sort already. Yes, correct. Okay, so that's one thing. So, um, yeah, let me write it here. So, sorry, sorry, can you just give me a moment? Yeah, let's just define improved bubble sort. Is that uh, first? Oops, damn it. If uh, after bubble sort, this doesn't change, it is sorted and can stop. Okay, this is the first thing. Correct. Is there anything else that we can do to improve? Sort zero until n minus one. Nice. So that we know that at, after every pass, right, at least the last n items are already sorted. So we don't need to sort the entire thing again. So I'll just copy the base code here. Now, in this case, right, actually, if you say, pay, pay attention here, there's already the pseudo code. So we can actually follow here. For bubble sort, I think what we're going to do is actually we're going to combine everything into one. So For I in range len LST, LST, you can actually like do a bubble of the list, but then you don't have to bubble the entire thing. You can just simply sort the last I the the first few items without the last. So the last n items. So in this case, I'm gonna limit it to the beginning until the last n items. And then basically, um, as uh, Leecher mentioned, if the, well, the sort is the same as the previous one, then uh, we, don't, we can stop sorting. Okay. So perhaps we can uh, store this in here. If if the list is equals to the new list, return simply you can simply return the list already. Okay. So let's try. So the results are correct. 
okay so like maybe like uh when our list is very small like this right we cannot really see the differences on the uh, time how like our our code when we made our code more efficient we cannot really see it but when you have a like a very huge list right then you can actually start to feel the time difference so i think to uh visualize it right our original code our original code is like this o n square If you guys understand about time complexity, this is O n square. Uh, this is actually the time it uh, takes to iterate, iterate through the list. So this is one time bubble, and then this is the number of bubbles that you we do, and bubbles. Now with the improved bubble sort. Uh, this is the amount of this is the the length of the list that we go through for each bubble. But then, ev at every iteration, the length of the list keeps on getting reduced. So it's more of a triangle now. Oh my god, writing is very hard. Okay, and then this is still the number of bubbles. But then as we observed earlier, right, at sometimes we can actually stop early when it's already sorted. So in fact, we can actually make a cut here. So instead of going through the entire triangle, we actually stop here. Admittedly, this is still O n square. Admittedly, this algorithm is still O n square. If you don't understand, it's OK. But this is still O n square. But if you can see, right, the area of the first um, bubble sort and the second bubble sort is much more different. This one is actually less, even less than half of the original one. So intuitively, we can tell that this is actually far more efficient than our first one. OK, what's minus i? Uh, minus i, remember negative indexing. So like uh, this one is negative indexing. i is the from this one, we iterate through i. So this one should be i is equals to 0, 1, 2. And then you know we know that at every iteration, after every iteration, that the last n i the last i items is all, already sorted. So we wanna uh, take the last i items and pull it out and basically just bubble whatever is left from the last i i last i or n items. Okay, so yeah, that's about sorting. If we do not sort, right, we can see that it's actually very huge. But then if we sort, we can actually make our code more efficient, which is very important when our data actually starts to grow exponentially. Okay, any questions regarding the bubble sort? If there are no questions, then uh, that's an example of bubble sort where we try to just like sort numbers. There's also many different kinds of sorts which you guys can actually see on the Visual Go page, where actually like uh, there's the there's the selection sort, there's the insertion sort. The selection sort is, I think let's just try. Just basically, you do a selection and then you sort them. You find the smallest number and then like you just select it and bring it forward. I think this one is discussed in lecture already. Take the smallest element and put it for forward. Take the smallest element, take it forward. Keep on doing that. And then we have insertion sort as well. So we actually arrange it one by one. We take a subset and then we rearrange it. This is the way I usually sort my cards when I'm playing cards. Okay. If that was too fast, try it on your own time. Merge sort, merge sort was discussed in lecture, I think. 
yeah, merge sort was actually discussed in lecture. We tried to just combine group, split them into small groups, and then try to combine them. That's merging. And I think the, mo the in most interesting is actually count sort. In fact, counting sort, right, I think it's actually pretty good for you guys to learn because counting sort can be very helpful. You guys actually do counting sort a lot. You guys do counting a lot, but you guys don't do sort. Maybe try to have a good idea of what counting sort does. So if you see what counting sort does is actually it just simply counts and sort in a data structure the number of times an object or an item appears. You guys do this a lot with dictionaries. So you guys create a dictionary and then you simply start counting how many items are here, how many items are there, and it's very useful in sorting as well. So yeah. Um, Counting sort is useful when the number of unique items in a list is very little. Because if the number, if the list is almost unique, then it's pretty useless. Okay, so that's all the types of sorts. Uh, there's a lot more, but I won't be touching it now. I won't be touching it today, actually. We'll move on to the next part, which is uh, which is uh, bisection method. Okay. So uh, for bisection method is actually an extension of the binary search where you try to actually find a value of x where if you put it inside a function, right, it will give you zero. Okay. Uh, how to say it? So it, why is it similar as binary search? Because in a bisection search, usually you have a start and a stop point. Right, as you can see, start at stop point, and then you just, which is basically in a binary search, that's the entire list, and then you want to find the point where it is actually zero. Okay. So um, the algorithm is uh, this is the very formal algorithm. I'm just I tried explaining it earlier, but uh, it's easier for me to explain visually. So I'm just gonna give you like around one. 30 seconds to have a look at it and see if you guys understand, which I highly doubt so. All right, I'll just uh, explain it visually. So say we have uh, these two points, right? We start with this point and this point over here. Now our goal is to actually find the value of x, which is, which will give us y. La. So it's this point, this point, and this point, right? There's three points, but then the bisection method will only be written as one point. So what the general idea is, we want to like cut a small uh, decrease uh, reduce our search space, which is this, into smaller space, search spaces so that we can actually find the value of zero. We want these two points to meet eventually. So generally, we want to reduce the search space by half. So we will find a middle point here. Now, the, the, we know that there is an x that crosses the y equals to zero if both points right are in two different spaces. So like the start and end point right are both in one in positive and one in, in the negative space. So when we have this point over here, right, middle point, if we pair it with this particular point, right, we do not know for certain whether the line between this point and that point is, is gonna cross um, y equals the x-axis. So in this case, the line can actually go like this. But then if it's like, if it's paired with this particular point, right, we know for certain that 
it will actually cross the x-axis, whether it's like this, it's like this, it's like this. It's going to cross no matter what, because like the two points are in two separate spaces. You know, it's like Singapore and Johor. You want like two points that are in two separate spaces so that um, we know for certain that we are going to cross them. Okay, that's a very bad uh, example, but yeah. So yeah, eventually we decided to pick the point at the bottom. Because the point at the bottom, we know for certain that, uh, you know, when it's paired up together, it will cross. Wait, where's my pointer? So again, now we have a new point at the middle over here, which is the average of the uh, value of x's. All right. Now again, as we say, we must pick two alternating points. So if this is the point that we pick, because we want to uh, reduce the search space. Correct, correct. Intermediate. Okay, I'm not so I'm not familiar of the intermediate value theorem, but it, I think it is the intermediate value theorem. So this because this is in the since the average is actually in the positive space, we want to take the point that is in the negative space. We keep on updating the values, right? Until it's until it is very super small. Okay. So with that, try to implement the bisection function with start and and the function to solve the problem. Okay. So this is the suggest suggestion. Generally, you want to get the A mid B, and then you get the F A F mid F B. And then you get after this, right, you must decide whether F mid, F mid will go to the value of A, or is it gonna be the it's gonna replace the value of B. Because if you can see, right, it's going to update either points, right? But which one is being updated? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is that uh, you guys can see the tutorial worksheet, right? Or the algorithm. Try to implement the algorithm. Uh, I'm going to break you guys into separate breakout rooms. And then once you guys are done, copy your answer to the... Copy your answer to the code share. Okay, I'm going to prepare the. All right. Um, oh, wait, you guys can't see my screen. Okay, so, uh, so let's talk about it. This is your code. Can you guys see? Can you guys see my screen? I think so. Okay, uh, so thank Okay, I see this is group three. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, group three. This is which group? Uh? Group. Da, da, da. This is group three, right? Okay. Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, let's start. Uh, let's start talking about it. Like, I mean, like it's an algorithm, so I I suppose everyone should have the same same or similar answer. So let's start with group three first. Um, we have by def bisection start and f. Okay, so like we here we actually are like finding the middle point. Um, if fx is within. Okay. Uh, margin of error, error, return x, means that we have found x. I mean, another way to write it, you can simply do like apps, f x, less than equals to uh, this. 
So this one is more clear, so you know that it's just like the margin. This one is a bit harder. Then like, okay, this one is a little bit weird. If the start and end, this is a little, okay, this one is okay. Cause like technically like you guys are checking like, like if this one is checking like if, if start equal, um, is more or less equals to end, but fx is nowhere near zero, then there's no solution. This is actually very nice because then like, you know, in this case, right, like um, if you have a, say, uh, yeah, like this. If you, both of your starting points are both at the top, right, you kind of can still like do figure it, figure the um, crossing lines off. Because technically for this question, right, actually we kind of can uh, make an if else statement like if both points are either at, at the top or either at the bottom then we cannot find a solution but I really love your solution that you guys actually think about it that even like when both points are above or below you guys can still solve it well done and then basically uh, this is uh, basically on the below it's just like a lot of if else statement I think this one is a little bit overkill um, I think it doesn't have to be minus one. It's just like, you can just like do like, if it's below zero or above zero, it's just for easier to read. Is it above zero? It'll be like that. Is it above zero? Then we'll do bisection, start, XF. Is, you know, you're gonna, if it's positive, right, then you assign this as your endpoint. If it's negative, you assign this as your. No, if it's negative, you're gonna assign it as your endpoint. If it's positive, you're gonna enter, and so on and so on. I think one thing that you, yeah, you need. I think this one is also interesting, like whether start and end is positive or negative. I think this is a very good solution. Well done, room tree. Um, yeah, everyone tried to actually understand room tree's question answer because actually room tree's answer is very different from the model answer, but then this one is good. The this but the function below, I'm not so sure who made this. This is one is actually closer to the model answer where we actually check whether it's uh it's positive or not. And then if both are on the same area then uh, basically return nothing else uh, find the endpoint if it's within the middle return mid else do this i think this one is copy paste from the internet because i saw someone actually uh gave me this answer as well so this one is actually very model answer but this one is actually very creative and uh, yeah this one is very interesting so yeah uh for those of you who didn't attempt, uh, try to attempt it. Um, it's you attempted not to learn the bisection method, but more for you guys to actually understand the logic behind binary search, because I think these kinds of search questions are actually very important. The logic behind it is very important for you guys to understand and learn from. Okay, are there any questions regarding uh, bisection? Going once, going twice. All right, let's move on to the final part of this week's tutorial, which is, uh, oh, Andy, yes. Go ahead. Yes, that's a, I think that's the problem with bisection method. The bisection method can only find one root. So um, that's why generally what you want to do is like, um, Say this is a, say it's a quadratic, it's a quadratic expression, right? Uh, means that you have two roots. Then ideally what you want to do is you actually find two 
pairs of starting and ending points to enter in to insert into your bisection method. And yeah, it's correct. You can only find one root. That's not because of the code, but it's more of because of the logic. I mean, generally what you want, okay, like it's, this is already quite bad. Lah. See, I have a uh, to the power of three equation. Lah. Okay, that's bad. So like say like I have like this, meaning that at this point, right? Uh, let's change color. At this point, uh, the, the function will be positive, this one will be negative, this one will be positive, and this one will be negative. Hence, ideally, what you want to do is that you want to take this pair, this pair, and this pair, just like one point, one point, one point from here, one point from here, one point from this range, one point from this range. Now, to find it, you can simply just use range. Maybe like zero to a hundred, and then like maybe like skip ten, so that you can actually sample the points every ten parts, the, the, and then like you can actually start to find out like which point actually, at which pair that does the number actually starts to change sign, and then use that particular pair. Okay. So I think that's how if you want to find all the rules are. Like you kind of need to figure out what the where are the pairs. So in this case, the pair is this one, this one, and this one. Okay, that's quite math. Uh. We're not going there. Any other questions? I think there are no questions. I'll move on to the last question. The last question is actually a different kind of sort. So going back to our earlier sorting algorithm, we'll be learning more sorting methods. So, okay, this is totally extra to this course, but it would be interesting to try different sorting methods. So again, you are given a list of n numbers. And for this, to simplify the problem, we assume that there are no duplicates, meaning that all the elements inside the list are unique. We pick any element to, of the list, say x, and then for the rest of the element in list, We'll separate them into two lists. One list is list A contains all the elements smaller than X and list B otherwise. Let's give the name to this functionality as partition. Okay, so let's try implementing that. Okay, so let's say we have we have a list and an element x. We want to partition it based on that x. So we have list A and list B are both empty lists. Oh, this is a bit funky. I think I'm just gonna write it this way to make it clearer. Okay, no, I don't think I can. For i in list, if i is less than x, you put it in list A. Else, oh, what's going on? Else, you append it in list B. Then you simply return both lists. Now, what's interesting is that we can apply some magic to list A and list B, such as they are sorted after the magic. So then we finally output the list as list A plus X plus list B. So let's define that magic. Kill list. Right. Our return output should be list A plus X plus list B. Okay. So let's do that. Magic. 
we want to apply some metric to list A and list B as well. So magic list B. But then like we don't know what's list A and list B, right? Then we need to do a partition. So let's do partitioning first. The list and then an X. The question is what is the value of X? In this case, we can actually just pick any random value. I think I'm just gonna take the last item, which is X is equals to list.pop. Yeah. And then I'll do this my partition. Then I do apply my magic and I'll return this. Okay. Now, if you notice, right, this is actually a recursion, right? It just keeps on calling itself. Hence, we kind of need a fail safe. If length of the list is equals to zero, then we'll simply just return an empty list or the actual list itself. Okay, so let's actually try try it running this. The magic. I think all my elements are unique, right? Yes, so let's try. Oops, my bad. And finally, the magic actually sorts everything up. In this case, you can see what happens here that is that it actually sorts out the list by taking one item and then separating it into two lists. One is lower than the item and one is above the item. And then we just ask them to sort themselves again. And then you simply combine them by anything lower than X, put it on the left side, anything higher than X, put it on the right side. Okay. Can anyone tell me what type of sort is this? And write in the chat. What is this sort? No one? Any tries? It's very similar to merge sort. It is very, I admit, it's very similar to merge sort, but in merge sort, right, you just split into half. You just keep on splitting into half. While this one, right, the way we split is very, it's slightly more methodical. You split it based on the X, in which X is actually pretty arbitrary. Okay, I think magic sort, sure. So I think it's okay if you guys don't know because so I'm just gonna introduce you guys. So th this is actually like the name is actually uh okay, that's actually two. The name is actually quick sort. Um uh, damn it. The name of this sorting is actually called quick sort, where we actually take a partition and not. So actually you can find more information in this page, Geek for Geeks, where um the idea is simple. We just basically keep on splitting the elements up. Take one, partition, ta -ta 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 -ta, we can see 10. It will slowly actually, you know, sort itself out. It's like merge sort, but more methodical. That's why if you see here, like the tree is not balanced. It is uh, slightly skewed to the left, depending on how we split it. Uh, merge sort will always split it in, in the middle. Yeah, I think it's a bit slow. I, I, I want to show you guys the simulation of uh, quick sort, but yeah, it's a bit slow. So uh, it's usually not like this. Eh? Okay, so uh, okay, we have this quick sort. Let's try, see how it works. OK, 
Okay, maybe this is a very bad visualization. Yeah, but if you can see, right, it tries to actually split. Just trying to like, you know, rearrange it, partitioning it. It's not super intuitive, but yeah, like, I think this one is not really a good intuitive sh way to show quick sort. But I think this one is uh, the image image earlier I show you is a better explanation of what quick sort is. It's the partitioning algorithm. Yep. So, yeah, that's part three for you. Um, I really cannot say much for this tutorial, this week's tutorial. But yeah, basically that's the end of it. This week's tutorial is just trying to expose you guys with all the different kinds of pre-made algorithms. And maybe you might, might be asking, how do I come up with all these different algorithms? The answer is you don't. You don't really come up with all these algorithms. So when and during an exam, when an algorithm is tested, you kind of need to know the algorithm. You cannot just like come up with something on the spot. You kind of can, but eventually it will be the same as the algorithms that we have previously defined before. Such as this, there's a lot of different sorting algorithms. So yeah, this is a good way to actually learn the different algorithms, especially if you guys are interested in CS in 2040. Uh, these are the things that you will learn. Lah. Okay. So, um, try to actually understand how does each sort works. Don't try to memorize the Python code, but just try to understand the step-by-step -step of how it works. If you can un actually understand the step-by-step, -step, then you will be perfectly fine in any test format, lah. whether it's Python, Java, or C. Okay, so with that, uh, we have come to the end of today's tutorial. This is the second last tutorial. Most likely next week is my last tutorial. So I do really look forward to you to meeting you guys next week. But until then, uh, have a nice day. I hope you guys are staying safe and staying healthy. And yeah, that's the end of it. Thank you guys. If you have any questions, feel free to stay. If you guys have no questions, feel free to leave.